I think Earthlings have definitely woken up to the urgency of climate change, maybe a little late. Is often cited as one of the most inspirational architects of our time. He's achieved what normal architects take decades to accomplish. And his work embodies a rare optimism that is simultaneously playful, practical, and immediately accessible. Please welcome Bjarke Ingels. Bjarke Ingels. Bjarke Ingels. Bjarke Ingels. Bjarke Ingels. My name is Bjarke Ingels. I'd like to unpack the complexity of Copenhagen. Without spending any money, just with a lot of coordination, we, we ended up with this environment that looks like a set from Star Wars. I hope I'm not giving anything away, but you will be 50 next year. Yeah, exactly. I think I can kiss the young architect uh, goodbye. Each time you take on a slightly bigger task, you, you will find yourself having to paddle a little harder because you haven't done it before. But uh, I think Frank Lloyd Wright hadn't started Falling Water, Guggenheim, nor Johnson Wax Factory before the age of 60. I hope, I hope that I will remem be remembered mostly for things I haven't done yet, right? The sustainable city or the sustainable building is not only the right thing to do, but it's also the much more enjoyable and desirable thing to do. R rather than the sustainable performance being a sort of afterthought, try to work with it to become part of the defining identity of a, of a project. If you have a, a long-term view, then there is no premium to sustainable design. What would you say has been one of your biggest failure? Welcome to Ecogradia, where we meet experts and practitioners at the front lines of sustainable architecture and urbanism. My name is Nirmal Kishnani. I'm a sustainable design strategist, author, and educator based in Singapore. At 50, successes and failures feel like stepping stones to something else. So I asked Biak, what's next? It's already a remarkable foundation for a legacy. BIG, Big, the design practice he founded in 2005, has a team of 708 cities with award-winning projects in just about every corner of the world. But the question of his future, the future of his firm, is linked to the challenges of a collective destiny. I ask him what everyone is thinking. What are the roadmaps and signposts to a sustainable future? From his vantage point as a global influencer and change maker, how will we get there? Biake is the first architect with this magnitude of reach and reputation to sit down with me on this podcast. Whatever anyone may think of him, he is a force to be reckoned with in the design world today. So pull up a chair, you'll want to stick around. A quick reminder before we start, check the description below for highlights and notes on this episode, or go to ecogradia.com to get more. And please, if you like what you hear, click the subscribe button below the screen to know first when the next episodes are out. And now, Biak Ingels. Welcome to Ecogradia, Biak. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's my pleasure. Usually, I close the episode with this question, but I'm going to open ours with it. What gives you hope, Bjarke Ingels? I, I really believe in, uh, in evolution. And anything that is evolutionary is somehow um, uh, progressive. That each time a new ability evolves, that ability accelerates the ability to evolve new abilities. Um, so like Ray Kurzweil would, in, in Singularity is near, he talks about the constant acceleration of innovation. Um, so, and, and, and he talks about the singularity because when you, you, you write uh, an exponential, you, when you plot a, an exponential curve, it goes towards a vertical tangent uh, that it will never reach and, and that tangent is like a singularity you, that you cannot see beyond it. That there is some kind of par paradigm change uh, that you cannot see beyond. Uh, and he puts the singularities sometimes in the 40s, in the 2040s, when, when human intelligence and machine intelligence merges. Uh, it will provide such, a, such an acceleration in, in innovation that things considered magic today will be uh, commonplace. And, and we're already seeing how AI is suddenly came out of nowhere uh, and is now everywhere. So, so I think just, so, so, so um, in incredible 
possibilities lie ahead. I think the I think Earth and the population of Earth Earthlings have definitely woken up to the urgency of climate change. Maybe a little late, but also you can see uh, if you look at how funds are being allocated, how legislation in the EU, for instance, is is becoming more and more hard towards uh, uh, enhancing environmental uh, performance. I, I think th there's a lot to be excited about. And, and then I think, you know, this idea that Darwin and, and Leo... Darwin and Leo, of course, are your two sons. Exactly. And uh, Yeah, I love well, Darwin um, so much that I call my first son Darwin. And then, then I think <laughs> if, if, if there's... What one son is somehow in the realm of science and nature, then the other one could be uh, in the realm of culture and arts. Well, so Leo is named after Da Vinci. It could also be Messi, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so they won't know that there was a time when you couldn't ski on the roof of the power plant, uh, <laughs> where the steam coming out of the chimney is cleaner than the air of Copenhagen. That is what's exciting about uh, the power of design and form giving and the power of evolution uh, is that we are constantly creating the steps for the next ge generation to leap from. So therefore, they, right. they will always have more information, more powerful tools, and... Um, And, and their normal will be so elevated from what we grew up with right. th that, that they can see and dream much higher and farther than, than, than we could. And, and that definitely uh, makes, me, uh, makes me very excited. I want to talk about your ideas on the future of the city. But before we get into this, let's focus a bit on buildings, starting with the premise that form is key to performance. Now, here is a quote from your new book, Form Giving. As architects, we don't have political power because we don't write the rules, nor do we have financial power because we do not write the checks. But we do have the power of giving form. Our gift is the world-changing power of architecture. So form giving in your book positions architectural form as a key driver of environmental performance. I'd, I'd like to unpack the complexity of form and performance in the context of one of your projects, Copenhill. Uh, yeah, I, no, I, I have to say that we went through a, a little bit of a, um, uh, of a, of a, of a search process, uh, looking for, for the idea. And, and in fact, uh, although now it seems kind of obvious, uh, the Eureka moment actually really only occurred like two weeks before the, the deadline, but, but essentially, yeah. um, the, uh, we, we had been given a kind of uh, phantom layout of the inner workings of the power plant. Uh, right. and, it, and it was a kind of stepped silhouette cascading down from one end to the other. Um, sort of with, with uh, the waste coming in one end and then going through a series of, uh, you know, like the, the, the silo, the oven, uh, the, 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 the harvesting of the heat and the energy, the, the scrubbing of the CO2, the filtering of the particles from the air and, and then eventually the chimney, right? And, and so, so therefore, some of the models were just trying to make architectural sense out of this diagram. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was only really when we started asking ourselves, you know, this, this, this will be the, the cleanest waste to, our, waste to energy power plant in, in the world. And the steam coming out of the chimney is going to be cleaner than the air of Copenhagen. So how, how can we make this something more and other than a cosmetic exercise? And, and that's, mm. that's when we came with this idea that, you know, um, that we actually don't have topography in, uh, in Denmark, really, and especially not in Copenhagen. Copenhagen is, is reclaimed land from the sea, so everything is a few meters above sea level. Um, so, so, so this idea of an alpine park uh, where you could, uh, you know, e even a, a hill where you can slay in the winter is a, uh, is a rarity in, uh, mm -hmm. in Copenhagen. So the idea that you could actually create an, uh, an alpine ski slope uh, where you can hike 
uh, enjoy the views and 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 ski and 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 snow tube uh, in the winter. Mm. So from from in the beginning, it was it was almost part of a kind of jokey brainstorm. But then as we started chewing on it and trying to essentially trying to shoot the idea down, it crystallized. And and it also it of course it helped that that the kind of general silhouette of the power plant was already like a a hill. So so once once we got to that point, um, the, the the project really started sort of designing itself, uh, mm. and um, the the facade is as light as we as we could make it. These uh, folded aluminum mega bricks bricks that are also planters, so the uh, the facade could actually also be habitat for birds and and bugs. Uh, the roof um, is planted, and again, like it had a very very minimal budget. Um, so, um, we, we started with 60 different species, all, uh, indigenous. Uh, so essentially the cheapest plants uh, you could buy, but also creating a, an authentic, uh, you know, Danish mountain. I like to say in Denmark, we have no mountains, but if we did, this is what it would look like. And, 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 okay. th- and then actually after two years, we did a survey that showed that, um, the, the, the biodiversity had doubled. So there were now more than. 120 species of plants. Right. So, so the the other plants had arrived by by bird and and bugs and and air. Um, so, mm. so 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 in that sense, what, once the ball got rolling, um, I would say that with each decision, the the design came closer and closer to the form that you uh, that that you see today. But but the form is really an expression of a future. The potential of a future where waste management and power plants are not contaminating eyesores that block the view and cast shadows on their neighbors and and contaminate the sky, but they are, you know, civic landmarks, social destinations for the mm-hmm. life of the city, both the people life, but also the the plant and animal life, um, and and in, and in that sense. It, it becomes a, a physical manifestation of the values and the potential of a future world. So did, did the design of the building actually uh, enhance the operation and the processes within the building? I mean, this building is known as an urban uh, amenity, as a kind of an urban offering. But I'm just curious whether it also had an impact on what was going on inside the building, apart from the daylight that you mentioned. Yeah, like I, I would, I would say. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, but of course, we, we worked closely together with the, with the engineers that already had a, a a kind of basic design, and then with them we tried to um, coordinate how to pack the machinery to sort of because, uh, right. like, t- typically you you might start trying to orchestrate it to make to make it as boxy as possible. In this case, we were actually um, desiring the the slope um and then and then i would say it's secondly uh w- one of the things we we because we were then working quite closely with the engineers uh we we um we 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 got to um, specify the color of the machinery um mm. as long as it was uh w- at, at, with no extra cost, so, so uh, all all the machines that are stainless or galvanized steel or or aluminum just came in the raw metal. Uh, there's some kind of silver gray um, f- f- fiber fiberglass uh, artifacts. There are everything that has paint. We chose silver mm. or the color code the closest to silver. So in the end, w- without spending any money, just with a uh, some uh, a lot of coordination. We we ended up with this uh, this environment that looks like a set from Star Wars because everything is like uh, <laughs> different different shades of, uh, of of silver and gray, uh, which which is very unlike the typical power plant. So just the fact that aesthetics and and intention was inserted into a part of the process where it's normally uh, not considered ma- makes the experience of the power plant. Um, uh, r- radically different. I mean, the idea that you can make manifest process and you can make 
serious and pollutive, pro once pollutive processes seem whimsical and, and fun. But I mean, um, it, it, the project is known as an urban offering, really. it's That's how it's been projected as a kind of a new public space, a new way to see the city. These are not common indicators of environmental performance, are they? I mean, um, it, so when you talk about hedonistic uh, sustainability, you're talking about performance in a completely different sense of the word. Yeah, and like in, in a way, it's, I think the idea of hedonistic sustainability is that the positive social side effect of a sustainable building or a sustainable city is that it can become more enjoyable. So mm. let's say the, the Copenhagen Harbor Bath takes advantage of the fact that the port of Copenhagen has now become so clean that you can swim in it. So that not only is better for the environment and better for the fish and the, you know, the, the, the flora and fauna of the port, but it's also more fun for the Copenhageners, they can jump in the port instead of driving for hours to get to the to the beaches. The the power plant, the technology inside makes it convert waste into energy and district heating in the most sustainable, attainable way. And the positive side effect of that is that rather than being a dangerous, dirty uh uh, you know, waste plant or power plant, it it can actually lend itself to the city and the life of the city as a destination. Right. So, so it's almost like emphasizing that the sustainable city or the sustainable building is not only the right thing to do for the environment, but it's also the much more enjoyable and desirable thing to do for the people that live live with it and around it. Yeah, I mean, for for too long we've um, we've sort of associated sustainability with this kind of uh, doom and gloom scenario, and really yeah, or, uh, or like sacrifices or uh, compromises, like the 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 idea of the cold shower, right? Uh, okay. And um, and 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 I think, but by, by integrating sustainability in. Uh, in, uh, in in our approach and by for, so for instance like we have a whole family of projects took it as a, as, a, as a main challenge I mean of course these are in mo mostly in sort of Mediterranean climates like California and Italy and uh, and, and Spain um, but but where the integration of photovoltaics into the architecture like the the catenary canopies of of Google's headquarters in, in Mountain View, or, or in Milan, we're making this large uh, sort of city gate into a, a, a neighborhood called uh, City Life. Uh, that that is a large suspended canopy that covers a square, shades it from the the, the rain and, and the sun, but also produces um, an abundance of, of solar power. And 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 in in Sevilla, one of the warmest cities in in Spain, uh, we're creating this kind of almost like pixelated solar dome that creates a shaded plaza, but also produces twice as much power as the building consumes. So in the end, we've made a deal with the power, uh, the power provider of the city of Sevilla, that they're actually running the, 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 the roof of, of this building. So, so I think, um, I think in many cases, uh, to try to sort of single out Rather than the sustainable performance being a sort of afterthought or an add-on to try to, mer to to try to work with it to become um, sort of part of the defining identity of a, of a project. There is a kind of a tendency to view um, sustainability as a premium um, in in architecture. Uh, and suddenly your projects have uh, predominantly been on developed economies and they depend on a lot of technology. You talked about using different kinds of paints and zero cost here. Yeah? Uh, but, but talk me through this idea of cost. Um, does uh, sustainability necessarily cost more? Um, yeah, like s some, uh, some, uh, some friends of mine, uh, Clayson Koivus Rune, the Swedish architects, 
they they once gave me a t-shirt that says uh, if you think good architecture is expensive then try bad architecture uh, <laughs> uh, i would say most of our work is built on the on the same commercial criteria as uh, as 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 all other sort of developer driven projects of course in the case of uh environmental performance i would say in the short term there will often be things that you can do that make a lot of sense but they will cost you up front right like like if you just take like um photovoltaics they're going to cost you something today but 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 they will uh, earn themselves back typically in a decade um so um there is a return on investment um uh, we just finished our own uh, waste uh, our own uh, headquarters in, in Copenhagen uh and the building is founded on energy piles uh so mm. of course the energy piles you have to you have to pile anyway to carry the building but by lacing them with uh, infrastructure for heat pumps there is a certain upfront cost, but you earn it back quite quickly because uh, you get a, a 5x on the on the energy you use for the heat pumps. You get five right. times as much uh, heat and, and cooling uh, in return. Um, if you have a, a long-term view, 20, 30 years, 50 years, then there is no premium to... Uh, sustainable design uh but but there is a lot of examples where there's something you can do today that will cost you more today and it will take some years to earn it back and and i think for instance like right right now we are um we're, we're working on the design of a on a sports arena uh in a in a desert so it has to be uh, enclosed for uh, for climate control actually uh mm. and it's designed with a series of like nested shells and um the the shells are oriented so that the clear mm. stories face away from the sun to the north so you get an abundance of daylight inside but all the direct sunlight is hitting the shell and therefore, it would be perfect with a photovoltaic skin akin to what we did for, for Google's headquarters. Um, and of course, it comes, it comes with a premium. Uh, and the return on investment is a bit long. Uh, it's like uh, it's a couple of decades. So uh, at least with the current uh, energy costs, right? So, so, um, so, so we, are, we are having to sort of find what very good arguments. Why, why would it be worth it to spend the money now? Of course, you, of course, you'll earn the money back in 20 years, but you know, you, you might be able to do other things with, uh, with that money, but, but then maybe it also like really elevates the, the, the perception of, uh, of the building. Maybe there are certain sponsorships. Uh, which is an important part in, uh, in, in major league sports um, that would find it more desirable if the environmental uh, narrative. So, so you almost have to sort of list a sort of a, um, a cumulative argument uh, on, on many different fronts and maybe in aggregate that starts making the case for, uh, for the, um, for the photovoltaic, uh, uh, cladding, like, right? yeah. I mean, um, the 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 case f for sustainability with an owner-occupied building is well known, right? So, if you're the owner and you're gonna you're gonna use the building and pay the bills, then of course you take a long-term view. How do you make that same argument to a speculative developer, uh, somebody who is going to pr um, build something and then sell it off very quickly? How do you get private developers? To think about the larger urban condition i think it isn't true 
that public and private interests are always uh, at odds. Because mm. I think in the case of city development, the, um, of course, the, the people living there, they, they want a lovely, lively environment. They want li life on the street so it's safe to walk uh, at, at all hours of the day or the night. Uh, they, they want um, free space and, and, uh, and, and green space. Uh, um, they want a desirable and attractive uh, neighborhood that's, that's fun and, uh, to, to live in and safe for the, for the people there. And, and essentially the, the private developers, they want the same. They, they, uh, they want to elevate the status of the neighborhood so that it is deemed as attractive and desirable. They, uh, mm. they want, uh, you know, they want to attract good footfall for the retail on the ground floor so they can get, uh, get good occupancy and, and, uh, and charge, uh, good rents. And of course they also want the, the homes to be attractive so that, uh, the, the, the rental value uh, and the occupancy uh, remains high or, or the, the sales go well, right? So, so that sense, like, to f when you're thinking as an architect to try to sort of constantly emphasize this synergistic view where you take into consideration the confluence of many different concerns, and I think the more holistically you can think, the more you can elevate the quality and perception of the neighborhood, the more value you are creating for your developer, but also for the, the future residents, right? So, mm. so I think in that sense, um, our first project in New York was the... Um, the VA 57, we called it the court scraper that combined the communal space of the European courtyard with the density and verticality and the views of a, of a skyscraper, right? Um, and in, in that case, the oasis really became the identity defining, uh, feature and, and one of the, the, the reasons that people choose to live there because they have their own little central park at the heart of the block. Uh, but of course we couldn't have done it if we wouldn't achieve the same density uh as as a tower podium so uh but but our developer says that they they charge comparatively higher rents and have higher occupancy than uh than the neighboring projects they operate in in this in the same area so so in that sense like that that kind of holistic thinking the power of form giving uh, mm. can really create create value for a long time the uh, the argument for green design has been a better indoor environment right so uh, the green mantra is that you know if you if you design green you'll get better productivity you'll get better comfort and therefore that translates to returns on investment you get better occupancy and so on what's interesting here is that there's a shift from focusing on purely what happens inside the building to what happens beyond the site boundaries. So the building becomes a relational object. It has a relationship to the city that either enhances connectivity or it kind of pulls back and creates uh, an oasis within a city. Um, that kind of selling now, is that what you're saying? That, that, that idea that your relationship to the city through that development becomes a selling point and developers are seeing that. Yeah, I, I think I think um, I, I think in general developers do understand um, that that their their interests in a way transcends the uh, the, the doormat. That uh, I also say if you speak if you speak with any any real estate agent, uh, they will say va value is derived from location, location, and location, right? And and it, and it's not the same location. It's location as in the zip code. Uh, you know what kind of a neighborhood are you in? That sets a certain criteria. Right. Then it's location as in the immediate surroundings. You know, is there a park 
ride adjacent or a view or the solar orientation, whatever. And then it's location as in where are you located within uh, within the building? Like obviously the penthouse is more valuable than... Right. Uh, so so I think in that sense, the, the first two locations uh, have to do with something beyond the, the footprint of the building. And, and the space inside. So, and therefore, like, um, and, and I also say, you know, like, if you look at a city, there's, I don't know, 5% uh, public buildings. You know, there's a, there's a fire station, there's a police station, there's a museum, there's a library, there's a school. Uh, but, but the majority of the building is really where we live, work, and, uh, and shop, and maybe park. And if all those buildings were just self-serving, selfish, uh, you know, citizens, then then you would end up having a rather poor city. But if, but if mm. each of these buildings actually end up contributing to uh, to the neighborhood, to the uh, to the ground floor, to the to the skyline, to the public realm, then uh, then you start having a richer and richer city. If you if you're installing the heat pumps and the photovoltaics and the natural ventilation, low energy consumption and 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 local energy production, then then over time each building can become um, part of a of a giant decentralized power plant mm. Mm. that each building in itself is a is a machine that that feeds itself but also feeds the city and i think with the the, jo- the joint research center for the european commission in sevilla we, we've actually su- we're succeeding in that that the building really produces twice as much power than, than it uh, consumes itself uh, so and and if 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 all the new buildings start doing that maybe slowly but surely you end up with a city that is in itself a vast distributed power plant. I want to talk a little bit about the idea of the future city. Who is responsible for the future city? What is the role and agency of design here? You've been involved with two very different thought experiments on future urbanism. Uh, The first is Oceanic City, uh, which is a modular floating settlement, which is tailored for sea level rise. And the other is Toyota Woven City, a prototype for future mobility in Japan in collaboration with a car manufacturer, Toyota. What does each project say about the future of cities? Um, I mean, if we we start with the the latter, like uh, the Woven City, uh, you know, located at the base of Mount Fuji, Toyota was uh, consolidating some of their uh, manufacturing uh, on other sites. So they had a sort of um, a good city neighborhood sized plot of land. T- Toyota actually uh, was f- founded in the 19th century as a loom maker. Uh, really? And then because they were, s- <laughs> they were proficient in making very large complex machines for the textile industry, once the, um, the car was invented, uh, they had the capability to make these complex um, mechanical machines and, and they became the mm. largest automaker in the world. And, uh, mm. and the president, uh, of Toyota, Akio Toyota, uh, as, as his name suggests, he's, uh, uh, uh I think, I think the great grandchild of, um, of the founder, uh, he was realizing that it was maybe time to pivot again. Mm. So from the maker of looms to the maker of cars, to the maker of cars, to the provider of urban mobility, in all its forms. Uh, mm. And so, and he thought, therefore, since we're not really about s- making and selling cars, but about providing urban mobility, we need to think about it systemically. And we need a living, working laboratory where we can test integrated forms of mobility, multimodal forms of mobility, driverlessness, uh, you know, fuel cell technology, battery technology, um, sensory technology, uh, you know, domestic robots, 
a matter net that delivers the goods into your home, uh, a fuel cell, like a hydrogen based uh, uh, power grid. Um, and, and, and to create this environment as a sustainable construction materials, like, like timber and, you know, lo local power production from geothermal and, uh, and, uh, and, and photovoltaics, uh, et cetera. So, so uh, based on that, we, we came up with the idea of the woven city. And of course, the, the woven part, uh, of course, it echoes the, the heritage of, of the, the loom making. But more importantly, it's actually because we said the street today is trying to do everything. Right. Th therefore, everything gets dominated by the cars. So what if we have mm. three different kinds of streets? One with autonomous electric mobility and pedestrians, more like a classic street. One for pedestrians and personal mobility like e-scooters and bikes. That's more like a promenade. Uh, and one that is really like a park where you can walk. And then by shifting, so every third street is, is, is one of these. You get these kind of mega blocks of nine where the center is always some kind of a free space uh, where you could have a kindergarten or a, a, a daycare center or a, a, a community center or, 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 or of the sorts. And then the other eight blocks are all connected to the, the car net, but they're also connected to where you can walk or, or bicycle. So then you end up getting a city where, and I think it's fascinating, we're commissioned by an automaker and we end up proposing a future city where two thirds of the right of way is actually giving, given over to more exciting forms of life than cars. <laughs> and, and in this environment, it's currently under construction, the first two, two or three phases. Uh, we're working on a, on a series of timber buildings, uh, uh, part of uh, phase two. Uh, and um, um, in, in this environment, they can, um, they, they intend to keep testing and deploying prototypes for how to make buildings or, and cities more connected, more sustainable, uh, um, uh, and, and, and to explore m more and more sort of uh, joyous ways of, uh, of occupying the space that is maybe freed up when you, when you, uh, when you take the cars away. I'm just curious, how does a car maker make money from a city that doesn't use cars? I mean, of, co of course, there, there will still be a lot of, uh, there'll, there'll be personal mobility. There'll also be mobility as a service. Uh, part of it is we're testing the e-pallets with a smart and connected city. Um, multimodality becomes much more possible that you, you might take, you might take a walk from one place to the other, but then maybe you have to go a little bit further. So maybe you summon, uh, a, 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 a sort of, a some kind of a driverless, uh, car, or, or maybe you just pick up an, an e-bike, yeah, yeah. uh, um, and, and I think that. That is somehow the the future is a much more seamless seamlessly woven complex answer. You don't have to make a definitive choice every morning. It's like I'm taking the car today and I'm stuck with the car for the rest of the day. No, you you might actually always be free to choose exactly what what works for you now. Um, and and in that sense, uh, I think Toyota really realized that. Their future is in is in renewable energy. It's in fuel cells. It's in uh, mobility as a service, uh, and and not just in selling uh, cars for private ownership. Let's talk about Oceanic City because that's actually under construction now, isn't it? In Busan, South Korea. Uh, describe the city and then the the challenges of implementing this urban model. Yeah, like so. Um, so first, first of all, we, we are we are uh, we're working on the realization of the uh, of the of the first floating city block for uh, for right, Busan. Right. Uh, and um, and and the idea of the floating city was, uh, you know, that the the founders were one one of the founders was a, a former minister from um, a French Polynesia, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a sovereign nation that is. Uh, f facing challenges of resiliency and 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 and, and could end up sinking mm. uh, because of rising sea levels. Um, so the 
the idea was to develop today the um, the floating city uh, that could save these uh, these island nations uh, tomorrow. Um, so, you know, we've already worked with a company called uh, we co-founded called Urban Riga uh, that is using uh, floating student housing right. to uh, a, to create a kind of a, a standing fleet of uh, of student accommodation that can be deployed at at dock sites uh, in, in different parts of the city. Um, in Busan, the idea is to create uh, a series of floating city blocks uh, that take advantage of the, the scarcity of land in a, in a bo- booming uh, port city like, like Busan. Mm. And, and in doing so, we develop uh, you know, all the experience with large, uh, large platforms uh, that where the platforms contain all of the necessary infrastructure for, uh, for a modern city. Uh, waste management, uh, fresh water uh, uh, supply, water treatment, uh, energy storage, um, e- even uh, uh, food production. Uh, and, and then what, what kind of buildings can you build on top? Of course, you want to keep the, the weight low. So, so working with like bamboo and, and, and timber, you want to keep the center of gravity low. So you're not going to put like skyscrapers on these floating uh, uh, platforms. So, so it begins to sort of define a city fabric of what a floating city uh, could look like. And, and by doing it today on commercial terms in cities where, uh, you know, water, waterfront property or inner city property is incredibly valuable, you're essentially printing real estate. Uh, but by, by, by maturing that technology and the manufacturing, now, a decade or two or three from now, when, uh, you know, a city like Miami Beach or, or like a country like the Maldives are beginning to uh, uh, s- struggle with, the, with sea levels, you, you can actually grow those cities on fl- floating uh, uh, parts and, and, and maybe convert some of the existing land into... Uh, parklands or wetlands you know like if you're on a coral reef coral reefs actually grow with the 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 water levels as long as you haven't built a city on top of them so um so and so in that sense it's it's almost like um an urban form that is taking extreme resilience as it's uh as it's raison d'etre like a to accept that we may have acted too late hmm. and, and, and certain parts would really benefit from, um, from, the, from the availability of, of floating city blocks. And, and you would say, and you say one, of the most, one, of, one of the most beautiful cities you can visit today is, is Venice, uh, ex- exactly because the streets are paved with water uh, and you sail through them <laughs> in, uh, in gondolas. Um, so, uh, so like a sort of the uh, Venice uh, for the third millennium. Right. The, the key, uh, uh, thing that jumps at me is the idea of uh, scalability. So this is a modular city. You've got these octagonal blocks, uh, that are, that can be incrementally increased or decreased, uh, according to economic activity or needs, I suppose. I mean, uh, is is the idea of the oceanic city becoming also a reality in Neom? Is that something that you are working on as well? Um, yes, yes, we're working on the um, on uh, Oxagon, the the kind of floating, half floating, half land based uh, sort of industrial city of uh, uh, of Neom. So it's essentially taking all of the necessities. Uh, of a contemporary city, the um, the energy production, the the hydrogen production, the the, the fresh water production, um, manufacturing, uh, uh, waste management, etc., and and, um, and and locating it as this sort of uh, industrial port, and to minimize the excavation and or landfill, we uh, essentially decided to put half the the city on land. And half the city floating uh, in the Red Sea, uh, and then a kind of 
um, a, a ring road, an, an octagonal ring road, uh, connects uh, uh, the the perimeter, and then you have everything from, you know, from uh, from from fish farming and uh, and 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 sea based uh, agriculture to uh, to you know algae farming for for for, for oil uh, like bio oil uh, extraction and of course like mm-hmm. so, solar farms and uh, uh, and and you name it and and um, and in this case. Um, the, the overall um, the, the overall city is uh, is, is is currently uh, um, uh, 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 under construction, including the octagonal uh, uh, perimeter, and um, and 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 part of phase two will be the uh, the gradual deployment of the of the floating parts. Moving on from a discussion of the future to a look back at your past, what would you say has been one of your biggest failure? What did you learn from it? I mean, it was it was a big blow to see the the two World Trade Center pass us by uh, after after having worked on it so intensely for two years. Um, but but maybe that was outside our own control. Mm. Um, mm. So I think the biggest failures are, are, are maybe just like little moments where where maybe inattention at at the wrong moment you didn't catch a certain thing from happening or something in a contract that seemed benign at the point when it became time to to deliver you realized that you didn't really have the control that was necessary in order to uh, in, ensure the right result um but i also think that a, a lot of these things were necessary steps in order to uh, get where we were uh, or wh- where we are, where we are now, and you just have to try to have the discipline to always evaluate afterwards what went well and what went wrong, and how could we do it better the next time, right? And I think in that sense, we have, I think, successfully built a a, a practice now of seven hundred people where. Where we can take on the the responsibility as the main contract holder for the future airport of of Zurich, the the biggest tim, timber building on earth, uh, like nothing of its kind have, has ever been built before, and and we actually have uh, created an organization capable of taking on such a responsibility, uh, and I think e- each time you take on a slightly bigger task, you you will find yourself um, having to paddle a little harder because you haven't mm-hmm. done it before. But uh, but it also gives you great exercise, and next time uh, you you know uh, how and when to paddle. I hope I'm not giving anything away, but you will be 50 next year. Am I right? It's a fact. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I can kiss kiss the young architect uh, goodbye. <laughs> well, I mean, I think in 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 our profession, fifties, uh, sixties, and seventies are often the creative peak uh, of a, of a great architect. What what do I, you think I are the challenges so. that lie? In, <laughs> so, what do you think are the challenges that lie in front of you? I mean, what are the big issues that you'd like to tackle next? I think there's a, there's a lot of avenues of, of interesting things, but 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 more than anything, I, I would love to uh, enjoy the fact that now. Uh, approaching 50 um we are in the process of building our first airport for zurich and it happens to be the biggest right. timber timber building the first really huge wooden airport we're actually also building a, a, a large airport building in luxembourg that is also made out of timber uh, currently under construction uh we, we're we're doing the the Valtava philharmonic uh, the opera in nashville uh the and 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 very soon the uh, what what may be the largest museum uh, on earth uh, almost three times as as large as as the Louvre just just to mention a few of the things that we finally arrived at being entrusted with so I think a, a major part of the of of the next decade is 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 going to be uh, enjoying 
the, 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 the tools we finally have to play with and, and, and to actually play something with them. So you just became a father for the second time and your son, Leo, when he turns 80, will witness the start of the 22nd century. How would you like him to remember your legacy? First of all, I, I mean, I hope, uh, I hope, I hope that I will remem be remembered mostly for things I haven't done yet. Right. Uh, that would be, uh, the, the, the most exciting prospect. I mean, I think Frank Lloyd Wright hadn't started Falling Water, Guggenheim, nor Johnson Wax Factory before the age of 60. So ideally, um, my, my legacy is, is still to be written. Um, I, I think, I think probably like this idea of, of hedonistic sustainability, uh, as, as a fundamental, this idea that to, to focus on, on the responsible and the sustainable as part of something that actually enhances the, the lived experience, that it's not an either or, but a both end, I think is a, as is an important, um, conceptual invention of ours. I would love just like, for instance, like Arab, the engineers today is thousands of, uh, engineers working in multiple offices all across the globe, but there is a kind of quality and rigor and strength that they are very often involved pioneering some frontier. Uh, and, um, and it's just part of their legacy that they were founded by Uwe Arup, actually a Danish uh, engineer, um, you know, some decades ago. Um, and I, I think it would be amazing if 200 years from now, Big is, uh, is one of the most interesting cutting edge, uh, creative environments that are giving form to the future of, you know, of, of, of energy, of mobility, of, uh, of, of, of living, working, uh, on, on multiple planets, uh, in, in the solar system. And, uh, and it's just, ah, if you, if you, if you Google them, you'll find that they were founded by me and, and, and my partners, uh, uh, centuries ago. But what's important and what stands is that we in, ended up giving birth to a culture and an attitude, uh, and a way of, of working and being and a way of giving form that, that has outlasted, um, myself and, and everybody else. Uh, um, I think that that would be, um, that would be a wonderful scenario. And, and that, that really gives you the opportunity that the most significant work can be way ahead of you, even ahead right. of, your, uh, of your own uh, demise. Uh, on that note, uh, yeah, okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an incredible pleasure uh, talking to you. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate the time that you put aside for us. This is my pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm, ha I'm happy we, we worked it out. I'd also like to thank you all for tuning in today. We are thrilled to have you on with us. If you like this conversation with Bjarke Ingels, please click the subscribe button below this screen to know when the next episode will be out. Your show of support is everything to us. It helps us make this podcast better, stronger, and goes a long way to bring you guests with critical and practical knowledge on how to make our world, buildings, and cities more sustainable, one blueprint at a time. Until we meet next, this is Nirmal Kishdani signing off in Singapore.